um, recording at this point. Awesome. The, so this is a bit of a presentation called um, an act to follow. I'm gonna share a bit of a PowerPoint with you all here. Um, here we go. Awesome. And then, sweet. So let's start the slideshow. Um, an act to follow. And where this title comes from is over break. I was watching the movie 42 um, with some of my family and and there's a scene in that it's the story of Jackie Robinson and his um, transition into major league baseball and the kind of the racial tensions that were involved in that and how they were able to work through and navigate some of those and the successes and some of the challenges they faced. And there's one scene in that where um, he says to the owner comes over and says to Jackie Robinson, um, it's like, you know what, I was walking by this park and you know what I saw, Jackie, you know what I saw, Jackie Robinson was having a little moment of doubt, of challenge, and he says, I saw a little boy bend down and pick up the dirt and rub it between his hands, just like you do, um, and in that, it's like, I saw a little white boy who wanted to grow up to be a black man. The idea of an act to follow is that there's something that comes out in the Catholic tradition of raising up saints that is in a sense like heroes. All people have heroes, whether they're little kids who look up to sports stars, whether they're others who admire certain kind of moral kind of standards that people are able to hold for themselves. We all have heroes that we seek to imitate, that we seek to follow. Um, and as Christians, the ultimate kind of hero that we have is Jesus Christ. Um, and the saints are effectively models of imitating Jesus Christ. Um, so it's John Paul II was one of the ones who really kind of ratcheted up some of these canonization processes. They say that he canonized more people during his years as Pope than every single Pope before him had canonized ever. Um, and already Pope Francis has surpassed John Paul II's canonization when he canonized a group of 800. Um, so it's something that the church is continually doing um, here. So how do we get there? How do we make a saint? Um, so there's four kind of steps that happen in the process of canonizing a saint. Um, the first is when they decide that someone is kind of worth investing into, um, worth pursuing their canonization, they'll name, him, they'll name that person a servant of God. Basically, the diocese in that place has decided that this is someone who is likely to go all the way because it takes time and it takes um, the money of paying people to prepare the cause. Um, so it's not, so it's something significant to make it to um, that stage. The next stage at that point begins a very extensive process of examining that person's life for effectively a life of virtue and of what ways in which did that person live kind of, and they interview anyone who was around that person, knew that person, if they were a big writer, um, like some of the kind of saints that have a lot more literary works, they'll go through and read everything um, it, it's a very, very thorough examination of that person's life. And then once that process kind of is formally stamped and says, yes, kind of it's, this is someone who is kind of of the saint quality, then they um, pronounce them venerable. So that's the next step, step two. And then become, begins the process of searching for miracles. Um, so in order to be canonized, someone needs to have two miracles um, approved. And so they go through a similar thorough vetting process of, kind of how did this person happen? Was it you're praying to the first saint and a whole host of others? Well, kind of how is it clear that it's this particular person? 
And then they have an extensive medical examination as well by professional doctors in whatever profession they're in. Um, and we had one, I think, um, from one of the stories I've been told that was for Blessed Basil Moreau, who started Holy Cross. Um, it was a person who had been healed from some illness, and it was a lot of medical examination had happened, but it wasn't determined enough, I think. Um, and so it's that's really a significant, thorough process that they go through. Um, and as soon as one miracle is approved, that person's named Blessed. And as soon as the second miracle goes through, that's when they're put forward for canonization. And the level of Blessed is really the stage in which you begin to see them really put forth into um, popular use. So they're being you, that's the stage and usually in which people start taking them as confirmation saints. Um, that's when they get a fixed date and for their feast day, like we often talk about, um, so like, um, what was it? Yesterday was the feast of St. Scholastica. So that's when they would get a date of that. There's a little play on words um, in the title here. You might've noticed the stories of African-American saints. There is the capital S saint, um, which is this saint that we've been talking about, who's formally kind of gone through the process. There's also what is called the little s saint, which is anyone who is in heaven. Um, many people have family members who they really look up to in regards to their faith. Uh, maybe it was grandparents who have really helped teach them the faith or bring them to church. Um, who I don't know, every now and then you hear, oh, like it was the rosary that my grandmother gave me um, and I took off to college and that was something that really I treasured. Um, these are all people to whom kind of we can pray as well. Um, it's basically the saints is going to someone um, who you can say like would know something about the situation and can kind of talk to guys like if you're up in heaven and kind of, we want can you put in a good word for me? Like, if you know something about this, um, can you help me with that? So it's, there's a bit of a, we don't understand, there's not a gap between um, heaven and earth. It's through Christ, there's a way in which heaven and earth um, almost sort of blend together um, in a sense. So that's, so the, Ladies and gentlemen that we're gonna be talking about this evening are in that process of canonization. Um, so these are the six individuals. Um, and just, I'm gonna give a little bit of a intro to each of them, and then we're gonna dig much more into two of them. Uh, many people do not quite realize that um, there are 4 million black Catholics in the US. And if that were all, if they were all congregated in one city, it would be the second largest city in the US, just ahead of Los Angeles. Um, this first one on the upper left is Venerable Pierre Toussaint. He was a Haitian immigrant um, born in 1766, who moved up to New York and was a huge, huge benefactor of the St. Patrick's Cathedral. Um, and we'll talk a little bit, a lot more about his life coming up. The next one in the middle is Venerable Henriette de Lille, um, who was born in New Orleans back in 1813. She was only one eighth African descent. She was light skinned and could easily have passed as white, but chose not to lie about that, as many in her family did. Um, this was before the Civil War um, and chose to identify with that part of her ancestry. And she started a group of religious sisters that worked specifically amongst um, Black Americans in New Orleans, educating them um, medical need. And when we were on one of our hope um, immersions through campus ministry down to New Orleans, um, we were able to meet um, some people that had been educated by um, Henriette DeLille's sisters. Um, and there's even a small little baptistry chapel um, in the back of the cathedral in which her stained glass window hangs. 
The next one over is Venerable Augustus Tolton um, from 1854. His, he and his mom um, escaped slavery across the river from Missouri into Illinois. Um, and then an Irish priest kind of took him under his wing, educated him, um, and was able to get him into seminary at the North American College in Rome. Um, and he was ordained the first kind of black priest in America. His preaching was so fervent that it kind of got up the ire of the kind of white pastor nearby because everyone was going um, to Augustus's parish. Uh, eventually he moves up to Chicago, is very instrumental in kind of taking the community, black Catholic community there under his wings, um, but tragically dies on a very, very hot day um, in Chicago. The next one down is Servant of God, Thea Bowman. She's the most recent person to um, be named a Servant of God to enter this process of canonization. Um, her cause was only introduced about roughly two years ago. She was born in 1937, um, she got a PhD from in literature from the Catholic University of America. Um, and then in the last half of her life as a religious sister, did a lot of work in amongst with civil rights work. Um, so we're, we'll talk a little, she's the other one we'll talk a lot about today. Um, the next one over is Servant of God, Mary Lang. Born originally in Cuba, she was well-educated um, and began to educate Caribbean children for free of charge in Maryland where she lived. The school that she started, the St. Francis Academy is still in operation today. Um, and they just had their big 180 year celebration in 2008. She started the Oblate Sisters of Providence, which was the first African-American religious organization in the US. Um, and that was in 1829 um, and they did everything, education, um, nursing. They cared for people during the cholera epidemic in the 1830s. They took in um, children who were orphaned by the Civil War. Um, they really did a lot of work in the, her community really did a lot of work. Um, and then the last one there is Servant of God, Julia Greeley. Um, her cause was recently introduced in 2016. Um, her eye when, um, her mother's taskmaster, I guess, was beating her mother and caught her eye. And so it was, she was basically half blind uh, for most of her life. Um, she moved to Denver, became Catholic, and had this large devotion to the Sacred Heart of Jesus and the Eucharist. Um, she was very, would be often at daily Mass, um, and always was known for carrying around this red wagon of just different goods that people in the neighborhood needed. Um, if somebody needed a mattress, she went out and got a mattress if they needed food, they did that. She cared for children so that their parents could get some sleep so they'd be arrested for work the next day. Um, basically a single person, St. Vincent de Paul Society. Um, and then today she's buried in Denver's um, cathedral in a nice, in a beautiful white marble tomb. So the first one who we'll go into a little bit um, is Venerable Pierre Toussaint. Um, his great grandmother um, was first taken into slavery in the Caribbean and he was brought from Haiti to New York um, in 1787, he was only 21. Um, he worked for the Berard family um, due, and because of the political unrest that was beginning in Haiti, um, they moved up to New York at that time. He had been taught to read and to write from a very young age in that household. The family um, educated him. And in New York, he apprenticed as a hairdresser. Um, he was learning to um, cut the hair of many women in the high society of New York. Um, and so it's many times, if you ever see his image, he'll often have a pair of barber scissors because that's what his profession was. He had a very sharp mind. He picked up the trade very quickly and went from learning to cut hair to cutting the hair of the highest clientele um, 
in his society. In, and it's rumored that he was even um, one of the hairstylists for the granddaughter of Alexander Hamilton, quite possibly an early testament to his earnestness, earnestness and holiness at the time. They referred to him as our Saint Pierre. With the various rebellions that were continuing to rise up in Haiti, his master, Berard, um, attempted to return to basically settle the land and sell the land off and then return to New York. But as fate would have it, um, he ended up dying there on that trip and did not return to New York, leaving Pierre to financially support the new widow and the rest of the other slaves in the house. At time, he even worked 16 hours a day, but he didn't have the heart to leave Mrs. Berard in her grief. Um, just before her death in 1807, she gave him his freedom. Um, he was 45 at the time. Soon he was able to purchase the freedom of Marie Rose Juliet Noel. He married her, adopted her niece, Euphime, um, who later passed away when she was 14 years old from tuberculosis. Together, their marriage blossomed um, in many ways, um, Pierre's and Marie Rose. Without children of their own, they threw themselves into caring for others. Um, for instance, they took in and cared for many orphan children. And Pierre had a very, he had a large place in his heart for children who didn't have parents, excuse me, possibly because it's unlikely that he might have, he was unlikely to have spent much time um, with his own parents. Um, and so quite possibly he had a space in his heart for others who um, had that experience. He was able to empathize with them. Um, he raised funds for the first Catholic school for black children in New York. And often they took in um, boys who needed a place to go. He educated them, made sure that they learned trades with which they could support themselves so that when they left his care, um, they'd be able to financially um, support themselves and those who um, were in their families and who they cared for. Additionally, they brought, they bought a number of people out of, sl out of slavery, organized a credit bureau, an employment agency, a refuge for priests and other destitute travelers. It, it was a little bit of it's, is a one man kind of Catholic charities basically um, before that even existed. Something that may hit closer to home in the midst of our own COVID pandemic, um, he lived through the cholera epidemic that began in 1832. And at times when they would basically section off certain areas of town saying, this is an area where there's a lot of infection. He crossed over those quarantine lines and went into um, those areas. He even brought a few of the people with whom he, that he cared to um, into his own home, continuing to nurse and to care for them until they recovered. Um, it was a time when many people decided that, well, I have the money, so I'm going to go off to a small um, suburban area where there's a lot of fresh air um, and get away from the city. And he chose to go into um, the area. Like our own current COVID pandemic, um, cholera much more heavily affected African Americans and Irish who live closer together in poorer sections of the city. Because of everything that he did, he was so intent on offering whatever he could to help anyone in need. Some have called him the founder of Catholic Charities in New York. Catholic Charities in that area of town was not officially started until 1917, but you can see um, much of the work that he did kind of reflected in that. Um, and one of the, he was one of the founders of Catholic charitable work in the U.S., he had a very devout prayer life. He often prayed the rosary. He attended the 6 a.m. daily mass at St. Peter's in New York's lower Manhattan, where he was a parishioner there for 66 years. And this is a very famous church in New York City. It's the same church that St. Elizabeth Ann Seton once attended before she moved to Maryland. It's the same church 
that um, Father Edward Soren, the first Holy Cross priest to come to the U.S., um, it was the first place that they had mass um, once as soon as they crossed the Atlantic. Um, there's a number of other, and there's um, a gentleman by the name of Felix Morelli Morales and a lady by the name of Mother Adelaide St. Teresa who are also in the canonization process. So it's almost like a little um, U.S. saint factory there. Um, but he'd be there every morning at the 6 a.m. mass, um, which... I mean, even after college, I imagine that's a tough thing to do. Um, the Eucharist was something very central to his life and something um, that must have fueled what he did very, very well. So he contributed a large amount of money to build the original St. Patrick's Cathedral. Um, and there's a story that's told that one day when he showed up um, for the dedication, that he, um, one of the ushers who didn't recognize him, um, told him that basically because he was black, he couldn't come in. One of the other ushers saw him, saw what was happening, knew who he was and stopped the situation and brought him up to one of the sections of the church with many of the other significant major donors that had basically financially built um, the cathedral. So he was one of the significant um, donors and financial supporters of who built the um, St. Patrick's Cathedral in the old St. Patrick's Cathedral in New York. As he continued to grow older, he continued to work tirelessly, continuing to give what he could to others in need. Um, and when encouraged, someone encouraged him to retire at one point, he simply responded, I have enough for myself. Effectively, he could retire. But if I stop working, I do not have enough for others. Uh, that was such a central part of his life. In 1853, after a long life of hard work, unprecedented generosity, he finally passed away at the age of 87. In 1968, his cause for canonization was introduced by Cardinal Cook. And in December of 1989, Cardinal O'Connor moved his remains to the current St. Patrick's Cathedral um, in Midtown Manhattan, where he is the only lay person buried in the cathedral. There are a number of bishops and cardinals all buried there, um, and he is the only lay person um, there. When he was, and at one point, um, Cardinal O'Connor um, had this to say about uh, Venerable Pierre, he says, Venerable Pierre Toussaint was a man who was proud of his faith, proud of his culture, and committed to serving others. Um, Pierre was a man who was, had a strong and sharp wit about him. He was very courteous, devout, generous, um, and is just a man for others. When we talk about a man of faith who seeks to put that faith into action, he threw himself tirelessly into that. So that's a little bit about Pierre Toussaint. Uh, the next individual we're going to spend some time with this evening um, is a lady by the name of Thea Bowman. Uh, she was born, her first name was originally Bertha. Um, she was born December 29th, so almost a Christmas baby, um, down in 1937 in Yazoo City, Mississippi. It's about an hour north of Jackson, kind of roughly equivalent to where the Louisiana and Arkansas line come across. Her family was Methodist. Um, her grandparents, she was born um, free, but her grand grandparents had been slaves in the Southern US. She, her mother was a, her father was a physician. Her mother was a school teacher. And boldly at the age of nine, she comes home one day and tells her parents, I want to join the Catholic Church. Um, and with their approval, um, they said she did so. Um, she had been so inspired by the witness of the sisters who taught at the school she attended, um, the Franciscan Sisters of Perpetual Adoration um, over in Canton, Mississippi. Those sisters that she met seemed to love and care for one another, and especially the poor and the needy. She was inspired 
effectively how the faith of those Catholics that she met kind of put their faith into action. She was a dynamic and very confident personality. At 15, she packed up and moved to La Crosse, Wisconsin to attend St. Rose Convent and study at what today is known as um, Viterbo University. Because continually inspired by these ladies, she wanted to become a sister of perpetual adoration just like them, though, just like those who had taught her in Mississippi. When she made her final um, perpetual vows, when she said um, yes forever um, to the community and to God, um, she became the first black sister in that congregation, um, that group of sisters. She had a brilliant mind, strong enthusiasm um, to the point that she earned a PhD in literature from the Catholic University in America and spent nearly two decades teaching at all levels of education. I um, mean, you think of someone who not only teaches at one level, but is versatile enough in what she knows to be able to teach at elementary schools, middle schools, high schools, um, even the college levels. Um, in the 1950s, she was a grade school teacher. And then even at some one point in her career, she becomes a professor of English and linguistics at Viterbo. She was even spent a stint as chair of the English department of Viterbo in the 70s. Um, but God and the church had other plans for Sister Thea. The Bishop of Jackson, Mississippi, asked her to work on intercultural um, topics, intercultural relations in the diocese. And it was a simple request that would completely transform Sister Thea's life and the lives of thousands in the US for growth, for transformation. She dedicated her life to civil rights. She worked to empower the black community while educating others about African-American history and experience and full of charisma everywhere that she went. She opened space for African-American voices within the church, especially in the realm of music. She would often weave song into many of her presentations and it's her singing basically exuded this joy that drove her work even when she began to battle cancer at the end of her life. She was one of the ones who helped to create the first Catholic hymnal that contained gospel music entitled Lead Me, Guide Me. Um, it was finally published in 1987. And she sang to demonstrate that the songs were more than simple praise. They were a means of communing with God from deep within one's soul, um, that one's life was put to music and sang back to the creator. One lady who knew her even remarked, her whole body would embrace the music. Her whole body would embrace education and learning, and she would just be this growing light for us. That's Dr. Deborah Pembleton. Despite this shift to a more pronounced focus on civil rights work, she still maintained various teaching engagements. In the early 1980s, she was one of the first to teach with the newly founded Institute for Black Catholics at Xavier University in New Orleans, um, which is the US's only historically Black and Catholic university, uh, founded in 1925 by St. Catherine Drexel, um, who was a wealthy philanthropist who came at a very young age in her 20s into a significant inheritance um, and the story goes that she went to Rome because she was trying to decide what to do with her life um, and somehow wound up with an uh, audience with Pope Leo. And he, she advocates like, we need, you need to send people to work amongst um, the African and Native Americans in the US. Um, and then she was moving towards missionary work in China. And he looked at her and said, famously, not to the East, but to the West. And he basically just sent her back to um, the US to work, um, doing the work that she was advocating for. And one of the significant foundation, a very, very sharp, sharp businesswoman, um, nothing, not much got past her. Um, 
including she was able to found Xavier University. Um, and another side fact, the first um, black and lay president of Xavier University, Francis Norman, um, they just renamed the Jefferson Davis Parkway in um, New Orleans to be named after him. It's now the Francis Norman um, Parkway. That recently happened at the beginning of this year. So in hindsight, what seems to be like the culmination of Sister Thea Bowman's work um, was when she would became the first black woman to address the Bishop's Conference in June of 1989, speaking on how poverty and racism intertwine to become systemic injustices. And as in all of her presentations, she concluded by singing, we shall overcome. And not only her singing, but she was able to garner the rest of the bishops present to stand, lock arms and sing with her. So it's, she was a very strong advocate for all of those um, with whom she worked and is someone who always went around exuding this joy um, that came out in her song in the way that she taught. And eventually she would pass nine months later on March 30th, 1990, after battling bone cancer, um, much, much too young, when she was 52, excuse me. When asked about what to say at her funeral, Sister Thea responded, tell them what Sojourner Truth said about her eventual death. I'm not going to die. I'm going home like a shooting star. So, Unfortunately, there's no video documentation, video recordings of Pierre Toussaint. Um, we have paintings based on the, um, I believe it's the one known photo. Maybe there's, I think there, there's a couple photos of him. Um, one when he's younger, one when he's older. However, because Sister Thea only passed away in 1990, a few months before I was born, um, there is video of her. So I'm gonna do a new share here. Um, and we're going to go over to this website here. Um, so here we go. This is this is Sister Thea Bowman. This is a short clip, one of her um, more famous, well-used lines um, from the address um, to the bishops in the in that day. What does it mean to be black and Catholic? Catholic. It means that I come to my church for devotion. That doesn't frighten you, do, does it? I come to my church for the functioning. I break myself, my black self. Sorry. There we go. What does it mean to be black and Catholic? Catholic, it means that I come to my church for the functioning. That doesn't frighten you, do, does it? I come to my church fully functioning. I bring myself, my black self, all that I am, all that I have, all that I hope to become. I bring my whole history, my traditions, my experience, my culture, my African-American song and dance and gesture and movement and teaching and preaching and healing and responsibility as gift to the church. I bring a spirituality that our black American bishops told us. They just told us what everybody who knew knew. That spirituality is contemplative and biblical and holistic, bringing to religion a totality of mind and imagination, of memory, of feeling and passion and emotion and intensity. A faith that is embodied incarnate praise. A spirituality that knows how to find joy even in the time of sorrow. That steps out on faith, that leans on the Lord. A spirituality that is communal, that tries to walk and talk and work and pray and play together. Even with the busy. You know, when our busy around, we want to be where we can find them, where we can reach out and touch them, where we can talk to them. Don't be too busy, y'all. A spirituality that in the middle of your mass or in the middle of your sermon just might have to shout out and say, Amen, hallelujah, thank you, Jesus. A faith that is 
attempts to be spirit filled. The old lady said, if you love the Lord your God with your whole heart and your whole soul and your whole mind and all your strength, then you praise the Lord with your whole heart and soul and mind and strength and you don't bring him any feeble service. If you get enough fully functioning black church Catholics in your diocese, they going to hold up the priest and they going to hold up the bishop. We love our bishops, y'all. We love y'all, too. But see, these bishops are our own, ordained for the church universal, ordained for the service of God's people. But they ours. We raised them. They came from our community. And in a unique way, they can speak for us and to us. And that's what the church is talking about, indigenous leadership. The leaders are supposed to look like their folks. Ain't that what the church says? <laughs> to be black and Catholic means to realize that the work of the ordained ministers is not a threat to me, and I'm no threat to that. The work of the ordained minister, of the professional minister, is to enable the people of God to do the work of the church to feed us sacramentally, to enable us to preach and to teach. And I ain't necessarily talking about preaching in the pulpit. You know as well as I do that some of the best preaching does not go on in the pulpit. But as a Catholic Christian, I have a responsibility to preach and to teach, to worship and to pray. Black folk can't just come into church and depend on the priest and say, let Father do it. And if Father don't do right, then they walk out and they complain, you know. That liturgy didn't do anything for me. The question that we raise is, what did you do for the liturgy? And the church is calling us to be participatory and to be involved. The church is calling us to feed and to clothe and to shelter and to teach and your job to enable me, to enable God's people, black people, white people, brown people, all the people to do the work of the church in the modern world. Oops. Here we go. Awesome. So that was a little bit of her um, excellent presentation um, to the bishops. Um, and though I am not an expert on any of this, this is just a little bit of my own kind of perklings and um, dabblings. Um, hopefully it's been a little bit enlightening um, and it's effectively what I hope to communicate is that the, the saints are not dead. The saints are not um, people who used to live around, um, and kind of we look to as significant figures. They're people who, because of faith, are still alive today. Um, there's a beautiful line from the uh, funeral mass that says, life is changed, not ended. Um, that it's a different way of living until Christ comes at the second coming. Um, and just like the, it's, I think the way in which people related to Mother Teresa is a great way in which um, we're e easily able to understand the saints. People went to her saying, you're close to God, pray for me. There were people who went to her saying, you are able to give food and medical care and et cetera to individuals please help me to find that. Like you're able to share your joy and fellowship with people. Uh, it's the saints are models. Like just as we look up to um, those individuals, uh, there are a lot of people who admired the saints for what they did. Uh, they wanted to support the work of Brother Andre at the oratory, Mother Teresa at the, um, in her work. They wanted to support it financially. They wanted to do that same work in their own neighborhoods. They wanted to learn from Mother Teresa and what she did. They wanted to be like her, to have her life serve as a model for their own. Um, and likewise with the Bowman, with Pierre Toussaint, with the 
um, other individuals, like we can take them as models to say, that's something that I want in my neighborhood. That work that they did, I look up to that and that's something that I admire um, and I want to put up on a pedestal. And in some way, they still live with us today through books, videos, people that knew about them. They serve as models. Um, a second way in which they still serve us, they still interact with us today is as intercessors. Um, there's many people who went and sought Mother Teresa's help for whether it's her medical aid for food. And there's still people that go and pursue and ask for her help today. Uh, whatever it was that was ailing them, there's still people who pray for her into intercession uh, for miraculous aid, ask for her prayers. And it's the same thing that we do with Pierre Toussaint, with Thea Bowman, saying, you know how to live the spiritual life well. You know how to live this human life well. I see you as someone who is close to God. Help me to be close to God. That there's someone not only that we can learn from, who can actively today and in 2021 help us in that journey, um, bodily, spiritually, emotionally. Um, and then a third way, and it's a way that's not necessarily listed here in which they help us is through fellowship. Um, they're members of our church, of our community of that continue to be united with us in the body of Christ. There are people who we can go to. And there's another quote, I don't have it in front of me, that talks about the saints, these individuals, basically as extended family. So like, yeah, like we can go to their room. We can walk up and down um, the hallways where their offices are and kind of go and sit with them and talk with them and chat with them. Um, if we need something and for advice or for help, that there are people that we can turn to. They are models for us. They're intercessors. They're friends. Just as Dia Bowman, just as Pierre Toussaint are for us here in the U.S. devout models of charity who cared for and educated numerous individuals who had nowhere else to turn, a nun who broke racial divides to show others how and to help and to encourage others to break that divide as well. These individuals, hopefully, and putting them up on a pedestal um, can do what a lot of people are seeking to do now is continuing to work on seeing, kind of, kind of healing that vision of seeing um, blackness as something beautiful and as something worth pursuing and honoring and as, just as much a part of our church as many other parts of the church, something worth honoring, something worth pursuing. May these men and women who are in this process of being declared saints of the church, um, which is a very investigative process, but also in a sense is a bit of rubber stamping what the church, how the church is already currently praying. May they inspire us and aid us, and may they continue to be for us an act to follow. Um, so I don't know if at this point I have space, if people wish to chat for a little bit, I don't know, discuss or comments or um, questions. Um, I'll do my best to answer um, what I can with the limited kind of knowledge that I have. Um, I guess if somebody has a question, they can go ahead. Father, where is uh, Louisa of Fatima? Where is she died in 2009? Where is she in the um, saint process? I would have to look that up. You're talking okay. about the lady um, who was involved in some of the apparitions. Of she was the main. She was the main. That movie, that movie was on recently, and it it's on Netflix. It's a beautiful, beautiful mm -hmm. movie. But the two cousins have already been 
beatified. So there are, they died during the uh, pandemic uh, okay. of 1918, but there were two cousins and Louisa was the, was the oldest cousin and she was the one who brought her younger cousins to the hill to meet Mary. Oh. Uh, yes, I would have to look that up. I don't know that off of the top of my head. Okay, that's okay. I could probably Google it too. So. Yeah. This is just a comment. I would have loved to have seen the the the, the setup when she started. Um, this is back to um, um, then uh, servant of God. Uh, Thea Bowman. Thea. Yeah, Thea. Yeah. Uh, Thea when yeah. she started to sing um, in front of the bishops, when she got them to lock hands and start to sing with her, mm -hmm. I would have loved to have seen that scene because they are pretty conservative bunch of 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 uh, men. of men yes <laughs> right. and um that would have been a hope to see that were there any black bishops in the audience there's a, probably a one from baltimore yeah that's right um, she, well, maybe not even by that by that by that time. you might not have been named by then that might have been too early the way she was i don't know the makeup of the U.S. bishops at that time, but she speaks as if there are at least more than one, if not a handful oh. um, okay. at that time. So, yeah, but that would have been, yeah, because <laughs> it's the cool thing about that is it was very near the end of her life, too. So it's almost yeah. like this crowning yeah. um, event. Yeah. So, so who so is it that makes the decision about sainthood? Um. In some sense, it's the people, um, because it's, in some sense, it's someone who is, has people, if nobody is praying to an individual, the church is not going to canonize that person for communal veneration, effectively. Um, mm. So, I mean, it's, you think about people who go on pilgrimage to different saints, shrines, and whatnot. Um, so some of it is the devotional life of devotional prayer life of um, the people of faith. It's they use different individuals who um, investigate the then go through and do the thorough investigation of the person's life itself. Um, and then at, at some point, there have to be two miracles that are thoroughly investigated and improved. And that involves all kinds of doctors and other individuals who are experts in those fields. So it's a whole crew of people. Um, and at the end of the day, it's the, um, what do you want to call it? The, I'm blanking, I'm blanking on the name. There's a, there's an office in the Vatican that is basically, processes all the paperwork effectively of those going through the canonization um, and then mm -hmm. the pope would give the stamp at the very end mm -hmm. but it's the faith and, and, of the of the individuals that that are reporting so, i mean i don't know that you could i don't know that you could divorce it from either um just like much other aspects of the church um so it's part of it, what they look for in putting someone up for canonization and sainthood is that are there people who pray to this person or is it like just a select group who kind of honor this and are trying to push it through? And if you don't have a large enough following, um, that's going to be something that they look at um, and they might do the Italian thing of I'll get to it next week. Um, and that turns into a, a year or two or whatever. Um, well, that was going to be my next question about a timeline. There's no timeline. It's it, it often, it takes years, if not decades, um, for people to go through. So, I mean, you think of the first Holy Cross Saint, Andre Bessette, died in 1937. And he was beatified... Want to say in the 2000s, mm -hmm. um, and then was canonized in I think 
I want to say 2011, 2012 or so. Um, but I mean, so that itself from beatification to canonization was probably seven to 10 years. Um, so it's, and, he, and he had a million people pass by his casket in the 1930s in freezing cold weather in January of Montreal. Um, and there was no, it's, the heating was only so much at that point in time. People stood outside for hours um, just to pay their respects to him. And that, it's, it, it takes a while for people to move through the process. Um, and some of that is to allow things to come out about their life um, rather than just rush it through. Um, so it's, you never know, um, kind of, I don't know, it's, sometimes it takes five, 10 years for um, various events to come out. Um, and so part of the wisdom of waiting is to allow um, that to settle. And is it something that the church as a whole is going to continue to hold up as a model of faith? Um, or is it kind of a something very ardent at that point in time? And once the dyna dynamism of the person is gone, um, then that fervor is gone as well. So. When they... When they exhume the bodies, is that part of the process? Yes. yes. And are they looking for the bodies to be intact? They're looking to see what's there. So just like when they go to the analysis the, and look at the person's life, they're looking to see kind of what's there. Um, okay. So some individuals, so one, a, I think he passed when he was 15 from cancer, um, a little boy in or a, teenager in Italy by the name of Carlo Acutis. Um, I think passed away in 2007, maybe. Um, but I think it's, I think his body is incorrupt. But they, I mean, there's photos of them exhuming the body of um, Julia Greeley when they moved her remains to the cathedral in Denver. Um, mm -hmm. And hers is all bones. Um, bones. As, as because in, Fat in, in Fatima, the two little children who died in the plague, when their bodies were exhumed in the 30s, I think, or 40s, their bodies were intact. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, that's, that's, that's something that they always look at regard. That's okay. officially part of the process. Okay. Um, hmm. and, that's, and that's part of, and that goes back to the very earliest days of the church. Mm -hmm. um, and the very earliest days when the church was um, not a legal religion in the state of Rome, um, they would pray underground in the catacombs in mm -hmm. basically underground mausoleums carved into the stone of the bodies of the martyrs, because in those days, the saints simply were the martyrs, those who died for the faith. Um, and which is where in, you get the, and so they would basically have mass at the tomb of the martyrs because those were part of the family too. Um, hmm. Just, I mean, it's, they were seen as part of the body of Christ that it extended beyond, like that just as Christ had um, conquered death, the martyrs in being attached to Christ um, would pass that as well. Um, and so the body was always seen as something significant as still part of the person. Um, Cause I mean, Jesus came back in his body um, after he died and rose again. Mm -hmm. um, and it's also where you get the tradition in every Catholic church. If you lift up the cloths on the altar, there's a square stone um, set into the altar. And you often, there's often like a small little circle um, in that stone, which contains a relic of a saint. Um, and it's usually like a, what they call a first class relic, um, which basically means it's, a, whether it's a hair or a piece of bone or some part of that individual. Um, and then, so those are first class. The second class would be something that the living person touched. Um, and then a third class relic is something that has touched um, one of the first class relics. So something that has touched um, the deceased body, basically. So there's always been a strong connection. 
not only to the body, but also to um, that they're still here with us praying, just like any of our own family members, just like you might go and talk to a loved one who's passed away as if they're still here. Um, mm -hmm. There's not a big distance. Um, anyways, uh, Matt, did you have a question? Yes, go for it. You uh, can you turn on your mic. <laughs> Over the corner. Up in the corner. Oh, there you go. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, yep. loud and clear. Awesome presentation. I loved it, and I'm so embarrassed that I got here late. Would there be any way that I could um, take a look at the part of the presentation that I missed? Yes, the we recorded the whole thing, so I can. I think I have your email, so I can probably send you the link as well. Awesome, awesome. So, yeah, the big job. Basically, just went through um, the different stages. Introduce the six individuals, um, the six African Americans who are in the process, and then specifically talked about Pierre Toussaint and Thea Bowman. Um, so, well, perhaps someday there will be a patron saint of New Jersey Transit who is responsible <laughs> for me being late tonight. <laughs> <laughs> well, maybe it'd be a patron saint against New Jersey Transit. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, that's awesome well, thank, but, thank father you. Would, would it be worth um i mean not worth it but um i'm interested in the other saying or the other um uh, holy people that we haven't talked about in depth well let me show you a great place to start um and going to look for those okay uh, there's a website called the um hold on let me do it here. Come on. There we go. Um, the National Black Catholic of Congress, which is basically um, all Black Catholics in the U.S. gathering together. Um, they first met in, I want to say, 1889. Um, one of the big organizers of them was a gentleman by the name of Daniel Rudd, um, who was out of Ohio started a newspaper specifically for um, Black Catholics and just would publish things voraciously, um, an intelligent and ambitious individual. Um, and Augustus Tolton, who was one of the other ones who we didn't talk about, um, the priest that was in the crew, he actually spoke at that um, conference. I think I have a quote here, but let me pull up the page. So about us, and then under, it says Black Catholic Sainthood. Um, and you just click on that. It's, oh, this okay. is where those, this, these are where those images came from. And I think they had those images made themselves. Excuse me, for, um, so that's Dalil, that's Pierre Toussaint, who we talked about. Um, Mother Mary Lang, um, who started that community of African-American women religious. Um, Augustus Tolton, um, the first priest and then Julia Greeley um, from Denver, Colorado. Um, and there's the artist down there. Um, but there's all kinds of stuff on this site and they are very good about um, keeping it up to date. Um, so Patrick Smith is a very, very good preacher, very holy man. Um, he's got a, he gave a homily at the 2017 gathering. He is, oh. He's fabulous. Yes. Um, I've heard, yeah. Different, different news stories um, and whatnot here as well. So, yeah. different events. So, there's all kinds of stuff. If you're looking to um, learn more as a place, that'd be a great place to start as well. Okay. Thank you. I, I was running for paper. It's the National Black Conference. National Black Catholic Congress. 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 Okay. Catholic. Thank you. Yes. There you go. Right up here. So. Thank you. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, this was wonderful. What yeah. a, oh. It was, it was very good. Great to, it was really great to learn about these wonderful people. And you did a, you did a great presentation. Well, 
it is not a complete presentation, but it is a solid start, a very good yes. start. So, Father, have you read the book? I'm assuming you've read the book about um, Father or the um, Saint Andre Bassett. The book. I've read one of the books. There's a number of them. It's, well, it's 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 what he he's building the church or building the. Um, yeah, it's he built the Saint Joseph's Oratory um, up in Montreal on M Mount Royal, which is where Mount right. Montreal gets its name. Yeah, well, um, I found the book at the um, Holy Cross Family Ministries, and mm. and um, I don't normally read those books, but I took it home one day and and uh, read it. And if you if to the other folks, if you ever get a chance to read the story about his life. That is such a wonderful man to read and about. And what is it, Brenda? What's the name of the book? Well, it's about uh, Saint Andre Bassett, and he was a brother of Holy Cross yeah. Brothers. Okay. And I can't tell you what the name of the book is, um, but it, it's you can locate it at the Holy Cross Family Ministries. Okay, thanks. Unless Father, unless Father, you don't know the title, do you? Um. I can show you the book that I read. Okay. Um, so here, I'll share my screen again. Um, so this one here is the That's one- That's it right there. Nope. Read by Jean-Guy Dubuc. Uh, no. So this, this is one that's in English. Because it's Montreal, Brother Andre um, would have basically only spoken French, um, but he actually visited this area a number of times. He had a bunch of family um, down in the New Bedford, Providence area, because um, there were a number of French Canadians who worked um, in the different factories down there. Um, so I think he actually stayed at, oh, it's whatever parish now has a church that's named Our Lady of Guadalupe. I think it's Anthony of Padua, um, but I think he actually spent a few nights in that rectory. It's the um, book that's a black cover with his picture on it. Yeah the one I'm referring to so um, but it's it's so, and then this is you all had spoken a little bit about the kind of end of that conference as they're gathering to um, sing <laughs> from one another. And you remember what they did with the clergy and the bishops in those old days? Where did they put them? Right up in front. <laughs> to lead people in solidarity with our brothers and sisters in the church who suffer in South Africa, who suffer in Poland, who suffer in Ireland, who suffer in Nicaragua, in Guatemala, in, in Northern Ireland, all over this world. We shall live in love. We shall live in love. We Anyways, wow. voice. So there's great. more. Um, you can find that's on YouTube. So if you open yeah. up YouTube and type in Sister Thea Bowman, that will very quickly come up. Um, so also it's at this point, I know it's we've gone a full hour and 15 minutes. I know if people need to get off, they can do that. If there's others who still have questions, I'm happy to stick around um, for more. Um, but why don't we close with a quick prayer. Lord, we thank you for 
this evening. We thank you for the gift of these individuals, for Thea Bowman, for Mary Lang, for Augustus Tolton, for Pierre Toussaint, for Henriette DeLille, for Julia Greeley. We thank you for the gift that they are to your church. May they continue to lead us in their example of following Christ, the same Lord who brought their uniqueness, their gifts, their talents out of them to share with the world. May we continue to learn by their example. We ask all of this through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. In the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Awesome. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Thank Father. you. Thanks, Father. Thank you. Thank you, Father. Absolutely. Absolutely. Have a good night. Well, have a great yeah. rest have a good of your night. night.